Namaste, everybody. Welcome. We're still here, but we're not exactly the same here as we were there. I'm on tour this week, so we have a great program for you to hang out with. <clears throat> so let me sing a little first. As usual, I start with this prayer. The Hanumat Stone. An invocation to that love that lives within us as our own true nature. The flow of grace. Pavanakuma Kalabana Pava Kagyanagan Jasuhradayaga Basin Ram Sarachata Atilita Baladham Him Shala Badeham Tanujavan Yani nama graganya Sakalaguna nedhana Vanarana madhisha Ragupati priya bhakta Atajata naman Koshpadi kurtovarisha Mashiki kurtaraksha Ramayana Mahamala Ratna Mandina Latmajan Anjana Nandanam Dira Janaki Shokanashana Kapi Samakshanta Andi Lanka Vayankaram Langa Sintho Salilam Salila Yashokavahi Janakatma Jaya Adaitane Dadahalanka Namamitam Ranjaliranjanam Manojavam Marut the Tulia Vega Jitendria Pudhimatam Burdishtam Atatma Jan Banarutamukya Shri Ramadutam Sharanam Prapathe Iram Dutam Sharanam Prabhadhe Iram Dutam Sharanam Prabhadhe Anjani Mati Patalana Kanchanadri Kamani Avegraha Parijat Taramula Vasana Havayami Pavamana Mandana Yatra Yatra Raghunath Kirtana Tatra Tatra Kritamasta Kanjali 
Vashpavare pare purnu lochanam Martinamat raksha santakam Ulabajaranga vale hanuman ki So, we're really blessed tonight to have with us two extraordinary guys. One is like one of the leading experts on the Ramayana, Michael Sternfeld, and the other is a Hanuman devotee and scholar and an extraordinary being. So, Philip Lutkendorf. So, they're both here with us tonight, and uh, they're going to share their, the depth of their relationship with Ram and Hanuman. So, uh, first uh, we'll invite Michael to come on. Now, you know, Michael and I have done this project together, Hanuman's Leap of Faith, and Michael is also doing the, a part of the Ram Dass's Gita course. So he's intimately involved with all our, our ongoing stuff. Here he mm. is. Hi, Michael. Hey, KD. Great to be here again. It's just been a few months after since we released Hanuman's Leap of Faith. And uh, I just got to say, for starters, every I always use images from the Ramayana. I guess that's just the way my mind thinks. But there's the story, and, and we're going to be telling stories tonight, is, is when Hanuman is crossing the ocean and Simhika, the Simika, the sea monster, she opens his her mouth as wide as possible and he expands the cosmic proportions. She opens her mouth wider and then he contracts to infinitesimally small and passes through her mouth. And that's what I feel every time I hear you sing. I just pass out, I come th come out the other side a new person. So oh, you mean you think about demons, is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're like Simhika the demon. It's nice to transpose it, but... <clears throat> Great. Um, you know, I, uh, it's, it's, we thought this would be a really good time um, to pull in Philip. I, I hope it's okay to call Professor Philip Lutgendorf Philip. And I was just thinking, you know, what we're going to do tonight, the main focus is going to be to tell stories, particularly of Hanuman. But I was thinking, you know, this is a bhakti crowd, the people, you know, the bhakti shakti crowd. And what I've learned being more a little bit on the knowledge side is, you know, when you expand your depth of understanding of the object of your devotion on a deeper level of gyan knowledge it really enriches it enriches and deepens your your sense of bhakti so that if i have a sankalpa for tonight is expand our depth of understanding of hanuman all his different facets even some unusual facets that we're going to explore tonight and and in, and, and in doing so enrich our devotion so without much further ado, I'd like to just give a little background on Philip Lutkendorf because I've known him for many years. He's actually, a prof he's been a professor for the last 33 years at University of Iowa, which is right in my neck of the woods. It's just an hour away from Fairfield, Iowa. So we met maybe 20 years ago when I was working on my audio production of the Ramayana. And he did this fantastic article exploring uh, the connect, the, the cultural phenomena of what happened with the Sagar family's video production that, wow. that overtook India and, and his depth of scholarship. And, and it was a cultural revelation at that time. So that's how we connected. We've been on and off over the years. And, and when I was at NKB Ashram this last uh, year, they mentioned, oh, Philip Lutkendorf uh, translated the uh, Hanuman Chalisa. And I said, oh, got to get in touch with him again. So we've reconnected and I invited him to join us and and I know you two also share a, a, a past connection. But I just wanted to show what, uh, <clears throat> now he's a professor emeritus, by the way, recently retired at uh, University of Iowa from the South Asian Studies Department. But this is his book that I just want to, I'm going to hold up. Whoops, there we go. Hanuman's Tale, Messages from a Divine Monkey. This is another thing. It's just a fantastic piece of scholarship on Hanuman. 
not only fantastic stories, but also the, the rise of the popularity, explores the rise of Hanuman's popularity. And we'll be talking about that a little later. I just wanted to show it. But another one, and I think it's setting the stage, is Philip, as you know, I, I'm a Valmiki Ramayana guy. I've been focusing on the Valmiki Ramayana for 30 years. We've been trying to cure you of that. <laughs> I know you guys are working. It's going to take a long time to <laughs> breed it out of me. But uh, uh, Philip, recently, over the last number of years, it's a seven-volume uh, seven translation of Tulsidas Ramayana called The Epic of Ram. Let's see if I can get this closer. Ramchandramanas. Yep, the Ramchari Manas. Beautiful. And, and uh, he's coming out with the volume seven very shortly. And one of the things that's unique about it, it's, it's in verse format. Most of the translations are in prose. So I think it's um, quite significant that he's managed to do it in its, with the way it originally was intended in prose. So I think that pretty much covers it. Um, Hanu, um, Philip, I consider a real scholar. Um, if I can think of the three Shaktis, I consider you're the Bhakti Shakti. Maybe I embody Kriya Shakti because I think of myself more as a producer, uh, putting out these productions to popularize these Vedic texts in the West. But here is Gyan Shakti incarnate. He really has the depth of knowledge and experience. <laughs> I know. It's too much it's in the academic world. Welcome, Philip. <laughs> Pranam and Namaste and Jaisi Taram and thank you, uh, thank you Michael and Krishna Das for inviting me, letting me be part of this. Yep. Well, then we only do it for our own selfish reasons, so we can hang out with you, as they say in the Ramayana. Yeah. Yeah. When when I went up to Iowa City last week to meet with Philip to talk a little bit about this, he's also a scholar on chai, and he serves the meanest Benares chai. Really good, really good. And he's coming out with a book on chai, but... Uh, well, <laughs> eventually. Eventually. God anyway, willing, yeah. To, to get the ball rolling, I'm just curious, I'm going to reverse this question, is, you know, in the opening section of Hanuman's Tale, you talk about this rise of popularity uh, of Hanuman throughout India that's really only been the last few centuries. Maybe you could just, what's going on? How come Hanuman has come to the forefront so much either again or now or whatever? Uh, how come? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I can't go into the whole historical picture that I, that I lay out in chapter two of uh, Hanuman's tale. But, um, you know, in a nutshell, one of the things I, I, I talk about is what devotees say, because people give their own explanation, you know, when you, when you interview Hanuman Bhaktas uh, in India. And um, what they often say is that he is the, the Ishta Deva, you know, the, the deity of choice of the Kali Yuga. Hmm. And uh, as we perceive ourselves living in the Kali Yuga, the age of discord and uh, confusion and, and disharmony, um, which I think some of us experience more and more, right, mm. uh, as being all around us. Um, Hanuman is the go-to guy. He's the person that you turn to. Um, the Chalisa gives many reasons why. He's, he's the guardian of Ram's door. Uh, he gets rid of uh, evil spirits. You know, he gets rid of diseases. So he's a, just a very efficacious deity for this uh, day and age when it's perceived by many people that um, some of the more traditional uh, means of accessing the divine seem harder to do or don't, don't work. Um, that's a very kind of within the tradition explanation. I go into, of course, a lot of historical stuff. I mean, it, it's a simple fact that that large images of Hanuman start appearing uh, about a thousand years ago. And uh, before that, there's really not evidence of sort of worship of him separately from the Ramayana story. Uh, but then you start finding um, freestanding images of Hanuman that suggest that he was being worshipped as a deity uh, in his own right. 
And those, of course, have increased in recent centuries, and they've gotten bigger in recent <laughs> centuries. My first chapter begins with a description of some of the gigantic ones that have been coming up uh, in the last couple of decades, you know, over 100 feet high in some cases. But anyway, that's a, I hope that gets at your question. Yeah. Yeah, that gets, that's one big Hanuman. Yeah, I think there's a yes. contest going on of who has the biggest Hanuman. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I published an article on that called My Hanuman is Bigger Than Yours. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Katie, what, what, what's your sense of this? I mean, it's just, you know, everything you do is oriented around Hanuman, it seems, and Neem Karoli Baba. It's just, what did, what did Neem Karoli Baba say about this? Well... He didn't say a whole lot, but being with him and seeing how the Indian devotees related to him, how they saw him as Hanuman himself, helped us find a way into that devotional feeling, that bhavana. <clears throat> and it, it was, you know, more than anything, and I think with Hanuman, the, the actual thing is, the accessibility, the easy accessibility. They say he's always ready to serve Ram, he's always available. Whereas <laughs> some of the other deities are busy doing other things, you might say. There's a funny story about a guy who was dying in the hospital and Maharaja was walking down, the, he, he said, doctor's a good man, but he's gonna die. Doctor's a good man, but he's gonna die going on and on. Doctors are good. And he walked down the road to visit this other sadhu who was known as Telephone Baba. And he was called Telephone Baba because he had a shawl that he always wore around his neck like this. But he, it was believed he could talk to the devas, to the gods. He would put the shawl up to his ear like this. <laughs> Hello? Hey, what? You know, like this, go like this. So Maharaji went over to him and he said, doctors are bad, a good man going to die. Call Vishnu. So, so Telephone Baba gets on the phone like this. Not picking up. <laughs> try again, try again. Oh, Narad says he's, he's ha hanging out with Lakshmi. He's not coming to the phone. So Maharaji reached out. Jat Telephone Baba had these dreads, you know, these uh, jatta. He picked, just with no, it's no apparent effort, he grabs his by, by his hair and he holds him up off the ground. He says, call Shiva. So he goes like this, good. And the, doctors, <laughs> the doctor who had just had a heart attack sits up in bed and he's perfectly okay. Mm. So Hanuman makes that connection. They say he's easily contacted, easily pleased, always ready to serve. And being with Maharaji, we experience that directly. Ac available to everyone, constantly giving, constantly taking suffering away and bestowing blessings. He, as it says in the Binaya Chalisa, which is a, a hymn to Maharaji, you wander just distributing alms to devotees. That's all, what you, that's all you do. You just wander distributing blessings. Mm. So... Yeah, I can experience that, the shift for me, having been a real Ram devotee for what it is now, 29 years, and then finally waking up to the possibility of transferring some of my attention to Hanuman. And it's a whole new ball game for me, because Ram, as one enlightened kind of guy that I was once hanging out, he said, he said, you know, when Ram comes into the room, there's just, there's so much being. It's just wholeness, absolute wholeness. Ram, Brahm, Paramarath, Rupa, embodiment of totality. Hanuman, who is extraordinarily powerful, he's the incarnation of Shiva, but still, he's so much more accessible. There's just something about his personality that is, is he's an embodiment of a deity, a devata, a deity who's so accessible on a personality level. Like, you, you would like to hang out with Hanuman. I don't yeah. know if you could handle hanging out with Ram. <laughs> Indeed. Um, my, my book starts with uh, um, one line from Tulsidas, um, More mana prabhu asa visvasa, ram te adhika rama karadasa. 
uh, in my mind, Lord, there's this conviction mm. uh, that Ram's servant is greater than Ram himself. Mm. And I, I use that as the epigram for the whole book. It's the theme, really, uh, that that explains Hanuman's, uh, as you say, accessibility and universality. Hmm. Yeah. S- speaking of referencing, you know, you just referenced <clears throat> the Tulsi Das, your Tulsi Das translation in Valmiki. You know, in our conversation last week, you, you made some very interesting contrasts between Valmiki Ramayana and Ram Charit Manas, and, and just especially in terms of fleshing out Hanuman's personality. You know, maybe, you, uh, Philip, you could just say a few words about that. Yeah, well, do you want the ones that are on the record or the ones that are off the record, Michael? <laughs> off know. the record, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I'm a scholar of Tulsi Das, and I'm not a Sanskrit uh, scholar, although I've studied some Sanskrit. And um, but I, I mean, I love the Valmiki Ramayana as much as the next person, um, and uh, admire it, and as as much as Tulsi Das did, um, of course. Um, but they're very different, and you know, Tulsi Das is much more interested in bhakti, and. Valmiki is interested in a lot of other things. There's a there's a devotional side to it as well, but he's not, he's interested in dharma, particularly and kingship and the you know ideal society, um, and you know various things that really Tulsi Das is not much interested in at all. He's just interested in love for for Ram. Uh, and devotion to him. So you, you end up having a very different focus. And um, Tulsi Das also assumes that his audience kind of knows Valmiki or they can, they'll can they find out about Valmiki from a storyteller, a good storyteller, um, who's, you know, chanting the Ram Manas and then expounding on it. So he doesn't bother with a lot of things that Valmiki goes into. And personally, as, as I told you last week, to my, to my taste, much as I like the Sundarakand of Tulsidas, uh, the Sundarakand of Valmiki is way more complex and, and psychologically interesting. The portrayal of Hanuman's personality, which you, you both have tried to bring out in your audio series. Um, the the complexities of Hanuman's psychology, as it were, uh, you know, comes across <laughs> very vividly in, in Valmiki, and I give him full full points for that. And Tulsi Das compresses it a great deal and and leaves out a lot. Yeah. Uh, we don't get the, the picture. I think some of what you're going to tell us tonight, uh, it's some of what you're going to share from the audio, Michael. Uh, yeah, is yeah. some of that uh, psychology, like when Hanuman, for example, doubts himself, mm. yeah. which he does frequently in Valmiki, and I can't offhand think of any instance in Tulsi Das where he does. <laughs> you know, can I say one thing? Yeah. I've yeah. been thinking about what the, the differences in the two Ramayans. One thing I think of is that Valmiki wrote in a different age, mm-hmm. and People, their their psychology was much more, for less of a lack of a better word, purer. There was less defilement of the mind and the emotions, and they could relate to, they they could they could experience Rama that way. Mm-hmm. But in this age, in this Kali Yuga, our our attention is distracted. We can't concentrate. We're all over the place. We needed a different avenue into into that love, into that story, and Tulsi Das gives us that. I think that's one thing. Just a different age, different language, really, or that spoken, uh, different mental concepts. Yeah, and of course there is the the belief that uh, Tulsi Das is somehow a reincarnation of Valmiki, who's yeah. come back to retell the Ramayana for the Kali Yuga. Right. Yeah. yeah, and and Philip is going to be sharing a story that I think impacts that. Even there was maybe even someone before Valmiki. We'll find that out shortly. Um, but you know, it's it's 
Um, interesting, just that the one thing I love about the Ramayana, why it's kept my attention for 30 years now since I started about in 1991, is when I first, like said, oh, this is it. I'm going to devote myself to the Ramayana, is I feel that it has this vertical depth. Um, it has this vertical depth that takes you down to this absolute level of life because Ram is Brahm, totality. It's wholeness on the move. You learn about to you learn what totality is. You learn what Brahman is and how Brahman could be incarnated in a human form and move through nature and transform nature with the combination of the Shakti of Sita and how they move together. So that's the vertical depth of the story. But I find it fascinating. So in, in that sense, I'm a real purist. I just you know, want to just go and work with the unabridged text of the Valmiki Ramayana. But then I absolutely adore this horizontal spreading of the Ramayana, which constantly recreates itself again and again, like mm -hmm. the line from the Bhagavad Gita, curving back on my own nature, I create again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the Ramayana does that, meaning in every time, in every age, in every civil, different civilization, Southeast Asia, constantly reinventing itself, even to modern times, like with the Sagars in their uh, video series, and even like Sita Sings the Blues, which I find a, a tour de force of creativity. So I love the vertical depth, but I love the way that Ramayana has enough, I call it, universal values embedded within it that it can adapt to any time, culture, place, civilization, and, and tell a story that's relevant now. That's miraculous for me, that the Ramayana has that potentiality, that Shakti power embedded in its, in its nature. You can comment on that or we can just go on. <laughs> <laughs> are are we going to get to the stories i think it's time to get to the stories but we need to prepare ourselves to get to the stories which is we do. is uh uh christian das are you ready to do another another uh chat sure. yeah maybe hanan chalisa yeah can't do it, can't that'll sure. get us ready to go into the storytelling hour right after this Guru Charana Saroja Raja Nijamana Mukuru Sudhar Barana Raghubara Vimala Jasu Chodayaku Palachari Udhihin Tanu Janke Sumeron Pavan Kuma Siara Balabudi Vedya De Mohin Ordu Kale Sabirkar Siavara Ramachan the Jesharana Jaya Hanuman Gyana Guna Saga Jaya Kapi Sati Unloka Uja Ramaduta Tulita Paladama Anjani Putra Pavana Sutana Mahavir Vikram Bajarangi Kumati Nirvar Sumati Kesang Kanchana Varan Viraja Supesa Kanana Kundala Kund Atta Bajra Ura Dvacha Viraja Kande Munja Janeo Sade Shankar 
കടസുവാണ് കേസരി നന്ദന തേജ പ്രതാപ മഹാചരവിദ്യാത്തു രാമ കാജ കാളി പ്രഭു ചരിത്ര സുനിവേസിയ രാമലക്കണ സീതാമസി സൂക്ഷ്മൂപ്പടേസിയാ ഘുപത്തിഹി ബഹോപ്തപരായി തുമാ പ്രിയ പരതായി സമാവാ സഹസബദൻ തുമാരോ ജസഗാസകി ശ്രീപത്തി കന്തലഗാനക ഭ്രമാദി മുണി സ ശാരദ സഹിതേർഗാപാലേ കബി കോവിദ കൈ സത്യ കഹാന്തി തുമപകാര സുഗ്രീവാഹിണ രാമമേല ശ്വര ഭയ സബ ജഗ യുഗ സഹസ്ര ജോ ജന്മ പരമാനു ധീല്യോതായി മധുര പലജ പ്രഭു മുദ്രിക മേലെ മുഖമായി ചലതിലാങ്കി ഗയെ അക്ഷര ജനായി ദുർഗമ കാജ ജഗട്ട കെ ജേ സുഗമനു ഗ്രഹത്തുമരെ രാമദുവാടെ സബ സുഖലഹി തുഹാരീശരണ തുമരക്കു കോപ്പന തേജ സമാരോ മഹാവീര ചോഗ ഹരെ സപീര ചപത്ത നിരന്തര ജോവിലാവെ സോവ്യമിത്ത ജീവന പല്ലവാവെ ചാരോയുഗ പരതാപത്തുമാര ഹേ ഫട 
Sivar Rama Chandra ki je Bhavan se tanwan ki je I think we've got that good settled field now to dive into bedtime stories, I guess. Uh, um, let's put it this way, bedtime stories is kind of like retiring into the self. So what we're going to do now, I'd like to just give a, just a little context of, you know, we've been, as Krishna Das mentioned in the beginning, um, we collaborated on this production, which is, once again, I'll be my little show and tell here. This is, let's see, Hanuman's Leap of Faith. It's a digital production, so this is the closest I can get to a book cover. There we go, Hanuman's Leap of Faith, which has 40, uh, harnessing the power of love and devotion in our life, 40 passages of Hanuman's great adventures from the epic Ramayana bringing us to the threshold of the divine. So it's interesting, I pulled out 40, I, we, I went through and with Krishna Das pulled out these 40 passages Everything Hanuman says, does, and thinks in the Ramayana. Oh, and by the way, must give credit here, is we called it a Hanumayana. And where did I get that term? Philip was the one who first put that out in Hanuman's tale. Luckily, I forgot about it, and I thought that I'd come up with it myself. But it's from <laughs> Philip. <laughs> um, and uh, interestingly enough, now to parallel that, independently, because um, Hanuman's tale, Philip's book on Hanuman, he has 40 stories also which is interesting. There's 40 branches of Veda and Vedic literature. It's interesting we've come up with this 40 connecting to the Chalisa. Anyway, so we're going to each tell three stories from, um, I'm going to play some audio clips from the Hanuman's Leap of Faith, and Philip's going to tell some stories from Hanuman's Tale. Um, do you want to say a little bit um, about your sources, Philip? Because, you know, yeah. it's not just Valmiki and Tulsi Das. We're going. Well, the... no. And uh, so I deliberately chose uh, non- Ramayana sources. Um, so uh, my my Hanumayana goes, you know, Hanuman's story begins before the Ramayana story and it ends after the Ramayana story because he goes on living, you know, on earth. Um, so I deliberately chose stories that are kind of extra Ramayana um, and are not found in the standard Ramayana versions that most of us are familiar with, particularly Valmiki and Tulsidas. So um, there, and many of them are folk, they're folk tales, but I, I drew on 17 uh, Hindi language books, texts on Hanuman, uh, the kinds of books generally that you can buy in little religious book stalls in, in Banaras or Haridwar or Vrindavan, um, you know, popular, popular books. Um, but a couple of uh, sort of scholarly Hindi books as well. And then two um, English uh, uh, books of the same type, uh, devotional books. Um, so that's where I took my stories from. They're all stories that are in wide circulation in uh, India today. And um, uh, quite a few of them are rather fun, actually. And as you'll see, I picked a couple of those for retelling today. Great. Before Good. before we dive in, KD, do you have anything to say? I mean, I know when I was working with KD on Hanuman's Leap of Faith, the main thing we did was he would tell me stories. I, I, that's expanded my frame of reference on, on Hanuman, just listening to KD. And you, you have so many sources on Hanuman's stories also, I guess mainly from Maharaji. Like I say, you know, it was little thing, you know, one story Maharaji told, actually Dada told me this story. Dada was one of Maharaji's great mm -hmm. devotees. Dada lived in Allahabad, and <clears throat> Maharaji would usually spend the winter there in his house. Mm -hmm. and one time they went to Chitrakut, and they went up to Hanumandhara, which is this big mountain in Chitrakut. And they get up to a place called Sita Rasoi, Sita's Kitchen. And supposedly this was a spot where uh, 
Sita and Ram and Lakshman lived, and this was this area was where Sita cooked the food and everything. And there's a little stream coming out at the top of the hill. And the story is that Hanumanji landed there after burning Lanka, and he smashed down on the top of the mountain, and the stream came out, and he cooled himself off. His body was very hot after burning Lanka. So Maharaji was sitting there, and he says, says to Dada, he said, Hanumanji came here to cool off after burning Lanka. And then Dada told me, Maharaji then said, almost under his breath, he said, but Hanumanji was always at peace. Mm. So these two things are really very important to me when it comes to feeling about Hanuman. On one hand, he's completely active, serving, ready to do whatever has to be done. But on the other hand, he never, he's always at peace because he never identifies with being the doer. He, he says, Ram is the one who does everything. He's the perfect servant. There's no me left in there. It's just very powerful. It's the epitome of devotion, wisdom, and, and realization. Mm. Yeah, that's the big three. It's beautiful. So let's, you know, we've chosen some stories, Philip and I, today, um, and we just confirmed this morning that are um, not your average Hanuman stories. <laughs> there is no average Hanuman. <laughs> <laughs> there is no average Hanuman. So um, maybe you should go first, Philip, with that. I think uh, the one that you mentioned to me this morning. Um, uh, the uh, stones one. Oh, I was thinking of the, well, whichever you feel. I was, thinking uh, of the I was going to start with the stones one. Okay, go ahead with the stones uh, one. These are, so to say, in chronological order. So this, this um, little incident occurs while the monkeys are building the causeway to Lanka, right? Which uh, I, I'm assuming your our audience knows yeah. basic Ramayana, right? Okay. So the monkeys are building this causeway to the island of Lanka to go and uh, fight the battle and rescue Sita. And of course, the two of the monkeys, these brothers, Nulla and Nila, have been given magical powers by the gods where they can cause stones to float on the water. And that's how the the causeway gets built and Rama is very impressed by this in this in this story Rama sees the floating stones and he's amazed and he says wow how are you guys doing that you know and the monkeys say to him well you know it's by the power it's by your grace and it's by the power of your name and Rama thinks to himself well gee if my name has so much power that it causes stones to float shouldn't i be able to cause stones to float <laughs> myself so he goes off to a secluded spot you know um and he picks up some stones on the on the uh, ocean shore and he kind of gently did, you know places them on the water and they immediately sink, of course, the way stones do when you, you put them in the water, which is, you know, what Ram had always experienced before. And he does it again, and the same thing happens, and he's starting to feel a little bit nervous, and he looks around to see if anybody has seen him doing this. And he sees Hanuman standing there, because Hanuman always is stays as close to Ram as he possibly can and keeps his focus on Ram. So Hanuman is standing there in a, in a reverent position, watching everything. <laughs> and, uh, and Rama says to him, uh, have you been here the whole time? And, and Hanuman says, yes. And Rama says, so you saw what I did? And Hanuman says, yes, yes. And then Rama says, well, look, just don't tell anybody about it, okay? <laughs> and and Hanuman says, "Oh no, Lord! I intend to tell everybody about this." <laughs> and Rama is deeply chagrined, and you know, blushes deep blue, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and and uh, but then Hanuman proceeds to give his his own ex his own understanding of the matter which is very beautiful i'll just read uh as i translated it from one of the hindi uh, sources he says lord anything you hold is saved 
anything you abandon is lost. If a stone has the misfortune to slip from your hand, how can it do otherwise than sink? Mm. Take it away, Michael. Mm. Let's see what Valmiki can come up with. <laughs> <laughs> Who's thought of, my Hanuman's bigger than yours? Right. Well, I, want to, I want to hear, Kate, Katie, you've got to have a comment on this one because I know you've talked about, you know, in your life, Hanuman has saved you, you know, literally, you know, from sinking. Uh, and Ram, the Ramayana. And I'm just curious how that translates in your own experience before we move on. Are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you, Katie. <laughs> I'm talking to you. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know I was saved. I'll have to figure that out. Let me see if Hanuman's watching. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have to say, Philip, I thought that I thought that story was going to be more about the power of the name of Ram, more being well, more powerful than Ram, right? Himself. And there and there so are versions that put it that way. Uh huh. And of course, there are versions in which the monkeys write Ram on the stones and. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that's what causes them to stick together and float. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm. You go ahead, Michael. I don't even know what to say. All right, so I'll go ahead. So, by the way, I wanted to comment of just that, uh, you know, when Philip and I were thinking, um, as Philip pointed out, that the Valmiki Sundarakanda has just so much more psychological rich richness for Hanuman. And I've picked out my first two selections. I'm actually going to be playing them from the Hanuman's Leap of Faith rather than doing the hard work of being a storyteller, who, uh, just like Philip just did so beautifully. So we're going to try this high tech version of just playing it out just uh, through my microphone. But the, the, the selections like this first one I'm choosing, you know, everyone thinks of Hanuman, especially in Tulsi Das, as the beautiful devotion and embodiment of love and his sweetness and his kindness. But Hanuman can seriously kick butt as well. And, and, and this scene is when he's first discovered Sita in the Ashoka garden. And um, he's had his conversations with her. He's restored her faith, kept her from committing suicide. He's, you know, the guards have seen him and all of a sudden they go into alarm because they see this giant monkey talking to, to Sita. And he decides to teach them a lesson. And he, and the, the uh, kind of the, secret guard, the Kinkaras, which were like his, his Ravana's special guard force, Hanuman utterly destroys them. And he's tearing up the, tearing up the, the Ashoka Pleasance. And all of Lanka goes into alarm. Who is this monkey destroying the, our beautiful Ashoka garden? And Ravana begins to send out his top warriors to go out to meet Hanuman. <laughs> Hanuman stands on the rampart. And this is a four minute clip. I'll play out what Hanuman does proclaiming um, um, Hanuman proclaiming basically his power. So let's get ready for some serious Kriya Shakti. Here we go. Let's see if this plays out well. Canto 43. Hanuman proclaims his purpose. Hanuman, who had come back to Oops. his place after slaying the Kinkaras, pondered, I have laid waste the wood but not pulled down the palatial place of worship of the Rakshasas. Now I shall destroy that formidable edifice also. Resolved on this, Hanuman, demonstrating his strength, flew up to the top, which was as lofty as a peak of Mount Meru. And standing on that lofty mansion, the great ape chief looked like a second sun rising. Bestriding that formidable and splendid mansion in all the fullness of his magnificence, Hanuman looked like the boundary mountain, the Pariyatra. Swelling to a huge size, the son of the wind god, conscious of his prowess, clapped his shoulders provocatively, filling Lanka with the din. The ear-piercing din caused by that clapping brought down the birds from the sky and threw the watchman of the temple into a swoon. Victory to Ram, expert in the use of missiles, and Lakshman of the immense strength. May King Sugriv, supported by Raghava, be victorious too. I am the servant of Ram, 
king of Kosala, whose deeds are flawless. I am Hanuman, son of Maruta, and slayer of the enemy forces. Not even a thousand Ravanas can make a stand against me on the battlefield when I strike at the foe using rocks and thousands of trees, leaving the city of Lanka in abject distress and making my prostrations to mightily, I shall go back, my object fulfilled under the very eyes of the Rakshasas. Having addressed these words to the watchman from the top of the mansion, he let off a terrible shout like thunder, putting fear into the hearts of the Rakshasas. Provoked by that mighty shout, a hundred men of the guard sallied forth, armed with various missiles and with process, sword, and hatchet. Those giants surrounded Hanuman and attacked him with maces curiously wrought, clubs with gold bands, and arrows that glittered like the sun. The huge horde of Rakshasas looked like a great whirlpool in the waters of the Ganga as it encircled the foremost of apes. Thereupon, the son of the wind god, roused to wrath, assumed a terrible form, plucked the pillar decked with gold that supported the towering mansion, and whirled it, which looked like the Vajra, swiftly over his head. Fire broke from it, and the mansion was set on fire, and on seeing the mansion burn, the auspicious leader of the ape hosts slew hundreds of Rakshasas, as Indra slew the Asuras with a thunderbolt, and took his stand in midair, and proclaimed, Thousands of ape chiefs like me, who are mighty and strong, and owe allegiance to Sugriva, have been sent out on this errand. We, and other apes like us, have been scouring the earth, some as strong as ten elephants, others possessing the strength of a hundred, while yet others have the strength of a thousand. Some have the strength of a whole Oga, others are the equals of the wind god in strength. There are ape chiefs whose strength is measureless, accompanied by millions of such apes who use their teeth and nails as weapons, comes Sugriva, who will be the death of all of you. Since you have incurred the inveterate enmity of the mighty lord of the Ikshvakus, neither the city of Lanka, nor you, nor Ravana shall remain on the face of the earth. Wow. <laughs> Rodra. <laughs> right. That is, Rudra. Uh, that's the Shakti, Shakti. Definitely the Shakti aspect. I, I wanted to play it just to see, you know, he's so strident, bold, mm -hmm. confident, just filled with his pride of strength and unabashedly proclaiming and 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 what he's doing there is really fulfilling Ram's purpose. Because he not only wanted to find the whereabouts of Sita, you know, there was an earlier canto where he was just describing, what else can I do? He was always looking at ways to further Ram's interest. He says, you know, I've 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 delivered the message. I've got the ring from her. I've given her Ram's ring. I'm able to go home. But first, I want to put fear into hearts the hearts of the Rakshasas, so they know that just I'm just the messenger. If I could do this just as the messenger. What's the rest of the army? can do. I mean, he was really strategic in his thinking, and that's just really important, but unabashedly powerful. Mm -hmm. um, no pulling any punches. And that's what I love about that particular thing. And it also sets up what I'm going to play for, you know, after Philip goes, uh, you'll see. Um, but uh, did uh, did Ninkrali Baba ever talk about that aspect of, of Hanuman, KD? The powerful aspect, the terrifying, the terrifying form aspect? There's a funny story. <clears throat> uh, one day at Kenshi, at the temple, Maharaji asked the Chokidar, the guard, to close the gates early. So the gates were closed and locked. And then he goes, Maharaji goes into his room. Right after that, a car arrives and a group of young men get out of the car and they come to the temple gate and they say to the Chokidar, you know, let us in. And the Chokidar says, well, I can't. You know, Maharaji asked me to close the gates and until he tells me to open them, I can't. 
And they said, you know us. We're here. We come every week. You know us. I, of course I know you, but I'm telling you, this is my job. I can't do it. So they got, they left and they got into their car and they drove away. Maharaji comes running out of his room and he, uh, and he goes across, uh, he goes out of, the, uh, out of the temple and gets into a car, his jeep, with Dada. And they go driving at breakneck speed to another temple nearby, Bhumiadhar, which was the first temple Maharaji built there in the hills. Maharaji tells Dada to go downstairs and to wait downstairs. And he sits right by Hanuman Murti, by the edge of the road, in the dark now, it's dark. And after a few minutes, you hear he, there were some sounds coming down the hill. There was a, a bunch of guys coming down the hill. Yeah, we'll show him. We'll break this temple up. We'll, he can't blah, 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 blah. And they, they got closer and closer and closer to the temple. And then Maharaji leaps up and he starts screaming and he runs up the mountain after them. And they scattered in all directions like this. And Dada hears this and he goes running up after Maharaji. By the time he gets there, Maharaji's coming down the mountain. He's just too happy. He's too pleased with himself. And he goes, Dada, I scared them. I scared them, Dada. I scared them so much they pissed in their pants, Dada. <laughs> and then he looks. This is there's only one other time that I've heard Maharaji talk like this. He says to Dada, don't they know who I am? Don't they know the battles I've fought and won? Hmm. Hmm. And what battles, you know, what, what's he talking about, right? We didn't mm. see that stuff. Mm. But who knows what, you know, don't they know who I am? Don't they know the battles I've fought and won? Mm. Wow. Well, I think we're ready to move to the next round here. By the way, just as a reference, that was Canto 30, 43 from Sundarakanda in Valmiki Ramayana. It, uh, Hanuman proclaims his purpose is the name of the title of that canto. So now, Philip. And I also think it's the first time in Valmiki when he calls himself the servant of Ram. Hmm. Up until that time, he's always identified himself as the servant and minister of Sugriva, I hmm. think. Interesting, Interesting hmm. point. And, and it's very significant that he declares that, you know, from hmm. the top of this temple in Lanka. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have a story that's, as they used to say on TV, now for something completely different. <laughs> uh, right? Um, and uh, I call this story Service with a Yawn. Um, but it's a delightful story. It's found in almost all of the Hindi sources that I use. So it's quite, it's quite beloved and, and popular. And it's also obviously pretty recent pretty fairly, uh, you know, within the last hundred years or so, because it involves the notion of a timetable and a schedule and, um, you know, so sort of, well, you'll see. So uh, the story goes like this, um, you know, Hanuman, after the battle is all over and they've gone back to Ayodhya and Ram and Sita have become king and queen of Ayodhya and Hanuman is, stays and he's given permission to stay and give service, seva, to, to Ram and Sita, and which he delights in doing. And he delights in doing it so much that he basically does everything. Uh, nobody else is able to get in any seva uh, mm -hmm. because Hanuman is always there and always ready to do anything that Ram needs, any little thing. And it gets to the point where even Sita starts to kind of resent it. And they, the, Sita and the three brothers, Rama's three brothers, uh, resent the fact that Hanuman is doing all this little personal stuff for Ram all day long, and they don't get a chance to do it. And so one day they have a sort of meeting, a little secret meeting, and they talk about this, you know, and, you know, Hanuman is just kind of too much there. And they come up with a plan. And they decide, one of the brothers suggested, I think it might, I forget who, whether it's Lakshman or Bharat or Shantugana, but anyway, they, they come up with a plan. They're going to draw up a service timetable and they're going to assign all the different tasks that are need to be done from giving Rama his first sip of water in the morning when he wakes up 
to uh, taking off his sandals uh, at night when he gets ready to retire, um, somebody from among them, the four of them, is going to be assigned all of these tasks. And they, and they, they draw up this very elaborate chart and they bring it to Ram. And Ram looks it over, reads it over, and Ram notices that Hanuman doesn't appear anywhere on this with any responsibility. And he thinks this is kind of peculiar, but he doesn't say anything. And they say, um, you know, would you, would you sign it? Put your royal signature on it. And Ram it does. He signs it. Um, and... Um, then the next day it's announced in the court and it's sealed with the royal seal and it becomes the protocol uh, for the day. And uh, the following morning when Hanuman is waiting at Ram's door, you know, ready to perform, you know, wash his feet or whatever, you know, start performing his seva, it, he's told, uh, oh, no, 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 you can't do this. It's been assigned to so-and-so. This is uh, Shatruga is doing that. And, oh, Lakshman's handling this. And Sita's doing that. And it goes on like this. And uh, everything Hanuman tries to do, he's told, no, 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 no. This, is, this task has been given to somebody else. And it's, it's, it's all there in, this, in the timetable. Look at it, you know. And Hanuman looks over the, the whole schedule. And he notices that he's not in it anywhere. And um, he says to Lakshman, who shows it to him, he says, um, well, nobody is, uh, nobody's covering yawning, <laughs> are they? And um, Lakshman thinks, you know, to himself, what the heck, you know, yawning? Yeah, so, Hanu, so he says, no, no, nobody's, nobody's covering yawning. So Hanuman says, well, can I do that? So Lakshmana goes, you know, sure. Okay, why not? Yeah, you can, you can be in charge of yawning. So Hanuman says, well, but I want that in writing too. You know, so they, <laughs> they make a little special addendum to the schedule and they bring it to Ram and Ram signs it and it seals it. And now Hanuman has this task. Now, what is it? Okay, you know, in India, when you yawn, it's considered inauspicious. Uh, because you're opening one of the nine portals of your body um, involuntarily. And it's possible <clears> that a, an evil spirit, a Buddha or something, might get in that way. So it's customary when somebody yawns that they do what's called chutki, which is snapping the finger. Trying to do it on camera here. They snap their fingers and they say a name of God, Ram Ram or something. Krishna, Sitaram, whatever. So, um, so this is the service that Hanuman proposes to do, that whenever Rama yawns, he's going to be there to do the chutki and avert any evil influence. Now, of course, a yawn might come at any moment. Therefore, Hanuman has to be with Ram all the time mm. <laughs> and has to be able to see his face all the time and focus on his face all the time. So this is a perfect job for Hanuman. He loves it. Um, and he just follows Ram around, you know, and focusing on him and watching and being ready to do a chutki in case Rama should happen to yawn. So this all goes okay um, until night when it's time for Ram and Sita to retire into their private uh, apartment, private bedchamber. And Hanuman is about to follow them in. And uh, Sita says, no, you know, you, you really can't come in here now. Um, and so then Hanuman is outside the door and he thinks, now what am I going to do? Because it's night and that's when people really yawn, you know. And um, if the Lord yawns and I don't do chutki, you know, I don't, I'm not doing my service. And um, so he decides that he's going to do continuous chutki <laughs> until the morning, until Rama wakes up. And he's going to repeat the name of Ram. And this suits him very well. So he goes on to a little balcony uh, there in the palace and he sits down and he just starts going. 
Shri Ram, Shri Ram, Shri Ram, or whatever, like this. Now, inside the bedroom, Ram starts yawning because, you know, service has to have a cause, right? So Ram starts yawning, and he starts yawning uncontrollably. He can't stop. He can't, he, he has these, one after another, these enormous yawns. So Krishna, you're going to make run. you yawn. <laughs> yeah. But he has this, this and, and it becomes alarming because he's actually getting red in the face and he's having trouble breathing. And um, Sita freaks out and she calls um, Koshalya, the, the Ram's mother, and then Vasishta, the, the royal guru, comes and the sister calls all the royal physicians and they start trying to administer remedies. Nobody's ever seen this. It's like he's having a seizure. You know, he's having this kind of attack of, of yawns. And um, they can't figure out what's going on and they can't stop it. And poor Rama is getting more and more uncomfortable and, you know, miserable. And at a certain point uh, after this has gone on for some time, Vasishta says, uh, where's Hanuman? And Sita says, oh, I don't know. He, he, he went off. You know, I, he wanted to follow us in, but I didn't. I said no, and he's, he's gone off someplace. He's probably very unhappy because uh, he's not with, with Ram. And Vasishta has a hunch, and he goes outside the door, and he looks up, and he sees the balcony, and he sees Hanuman sitting up there going doing chutki and going ram, 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 ram. And he goes up and he says, Hanuman, Hanuman, come down here quickly. There's something happening. It's, it's, it's serious. And Hanuman comes down with him into the bedroom. And of course, as soon as he comes in and he sees Rama in this terrible state, Hanuman stops doing what he's doing and bows, throws himself, you know, and, at Ram's feet and says, oh, you know, Lord, save me, save me. And the minute Hanuman stops doing chutki, Rama's yawning stops and his facial muscles relax and he's able to take a deep breath and, and everybody breathes a sigh of relief. And Sita realizes what has happened and she bows to Ram and she says, Oh Lord, we have committed a great injustice to your servant and forgive us. And henceforth we will never interfere with any act of servant of service that he wants to perform to you. Mm. 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 Sweet. Oh, sweet. I mean, I like the way it domesticates <clears throat> all the characters. It, it, <laughs> it gives them, you know, very human personalities and motivations mm. and mm. even little petty jealousies. Mm. Who gets to do what for whom, right? Mm -hmm. Just like real life. Just like real life, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, so I really think it it's, it's, um, people sometimes think that if you treat these deities in a, a little bit irreverent way, that it actually makes them less. For me, making them more like on a human level with their mm -hmm. full range of emotion makes it more, because then they're more, it's more intimate, it's more accessible. These are avatar, he came down, um, Ram came down in a man's body, and and Shiva or Vayu, as his father, came down in the body of a monkey, and he lives as a monkey, and uh, with his monkey mind that's referred to a lot in the Ramayana. Um, well, watch out, Michael, because I'm going to domesticate Valmiki in my third story. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to now. That's a perfect segue into this next section. Um, this is. Um, <clears throat> perfect for what we're talking about, because we um, this is something that came up in my conversation with Philip last week, is that um, we never think of Hanuman as doubting himself. And this one, this canto, which is Canto 55, Hanuman is satisfied that Sita is safe. Hanuman has just burned all of Lanka, destroyed almost all the buildings, killed many of the people in the population, and then it hits him. What about Sita? Is Sita safe? You know, how could I do this? So let's get ready. This one's just a little longer. It's about five or six minutes, but you'll get a flavor of Hanuman. And well, I'm not going to say more. It's, it'll let it speak for itself. 
Um, here we go. Canto 55. Hanuman is satisfied that Sita is safe. Having set all Lanka ablaze, the ape chief of the immense strength quenched in the sea the fire on his tail. As he was looking at the blazing city of Lanka, which had suffered heavy damage and whose Rakshasa population was in a state of panic, a thought suddenly crossed the mind of the ape Hanuman and a great fear seized him. He was disgusted with himself as he reflected what an outrageous deed I have done, burning down Lanka. Fortunate indeed are those truly great souls whose intelligence keeps anger in check as burning fire is put out by water. Where is the man who, mastered by anger, will not commit the most heinous crime, even the murder of revered elders? The angry man will insult even the saintly with harsh words, and in his rage he does not mind what he says, however obnoxious it might be. There is nothing that the man possessed by wrath will not say or do. He alone is entitled to be called a man who ejects anger by patience as the snake sloughs off its worn-out skin. Fie on me, for the shameless fool that I am, I have done an exceedingly wicked deed in raising this fire, forgetful of Sita, and thus gravely injuring my master. If the noble Janaki has also been burnt along with the burning Lanka, then I have thoughtlessly ruined my master's business. The whole purpose in furtherance of which this enterprise was launched has been frustrated because I failed to protect Sita while burning Lanka. The task I was entrusted with had been all but completed, but succumbing to anger, I have ruined the whole thing. Janaki must be dead, for there is no part of the city, so far as I can see, that has not been burnt down. The entire city has been reduced to ashes. If the object of my coming has been ruined by my folly, the laying down of my life here would be welcome to me too. Now I shall throw myself into the fire, or fall into the jaws of the great fire in the depths of the ocean, or yield my body as a prey to the creatures of the sea. How could I, having ruined everything, bring myself to face alive the sovereign of the apes or those tigers among men? I have indeed demonstrated by my folly in yielding to anger the fickleness of the monkey, which is proverbial in the three worlds. Fie on this chronic restlessness, unbridled by control or steadfastness or fixity of purpose. Though I could have saved Sita, I failed to do that from unreasoning anger. If Sita should be dead, those two will also die. And when they die, Sugriva too will perish along with his kin. On hearing of this, the virtuous Bharat, who loves his brother and Shatrugna would find it impossible to go on living. When the family of the Ikshvakus thus perishes for a certainty, their subjects will all fall into the harrowing agony of grief. Thus, I should be the cause of this world disaster because my fortune has deserted me and I have forfeited the fruits of Dharma and Artha being submerged by the tides of anger. When he was thus pondering sadly, there occurred auspicious omens, such as he had seen before, and Hanuman reflected, but who knows? She who is lovely in every limb may have been saved by her own power. She who is herself a power for good could not possibly die, for fire does not prevail against fire. Fire cannot touch the spouse of that righteous soul of limitless puissance, whose virtue is her own armor. Did not fire, whose nature is to burn, leave me unscathed because of Ram's greatness and the fruits of Vaidehi's good deeds? How could she perish, who is the darling of Ram's heart and is as a goddess to his three brothers, Bharat and the rest? If fire, 
whose business is to burn and who masters all things and is eternal does not burn my tail, how could he burn the noble dame? And Hanuman recollected with renewed wonder the mountain of the golden navel showing itself in the midst of the sea. By virtue of her austerities, truthfulness, and wholehearted loyalty to her lord, she might burn fire if she wanted to, mm. but fire cannot burn her. As Hanuman thus dwelt in his mind on the immensity of the good dame's virtues, he heard mighty Charana saying, How wonderful this exploit of Hanuman in burning the entire city of the Rakshasas, with its panic-stricken Rakshasa women, children, and old men, fleeing in disorder and confusion, and the uproar raised by the populace rebounding from the mountain caves, the city seemed to wail in distress. How amazing that while the entire city, including the ramparts with their watchtowers and gateways, have been burnt down, that Janaki has not been touched by the fire. And Hanuman, seeing those auspicious omens whose truth had been tested again and again, hearing the reassuring words of the sages and regaining confidence, was happy. The ape, who had achieved his cherished object and heard that the princess was unscathed, decided to return after seeing her once again. Hmm. Interesting contrast between what we saw in the previous scene that I played out when Hanuman proclaims his purpose with such strident power. And now he's filled with doubt, a telescoping series of self-doubt, you know, going to the fact that his single act is going to be the cause of the destruction of the whole world. A lot of, a lot of responsibility to put on his shoulders. And yet, yet and it shows us, it takes us on that journey of as we have often, I, you know, going into self-doubt of my action that I thought had totally blown it, and then how he listened to these divine omens to restore his own faith. He had just done that for Sita. And now, so you see, this is to me the beauty of it. it one, you can say, how could someone so great as Hanuman go through all that self-doubt and permu permutations in his mind? But if he can do it and come out of it, it helps us traverse that same field. Yeah, and he goes into what uh, psychologists call, you know, catastrophizing, right? <laughs> well, this is going to lead to this, and this is going to lead to that, and that's going to lead, you know, and it's, it's so human. Hmm. Yeah, I think we've all been catastrophizing a little bit lately, you yeah. know, with what's going on in the world. It's easy to. It's yeah. easy to. And Hanuman, show, I feel, shows the way out. Yeah. He get, reasons he reasons his way out, which is very nice. Yeah, using that Sita, kind of can, can, Sita is fire; she cannot be burned by fire. Right. Did did Mimkali Baba ever talk about that kind of like the way we use our minds to dig our own holes and how we dig out ourselves out? I mean, is that <clears throat> is any stories on that that you remember, KD? Not really. I mean, he would just he would just say to go on repeating the name and uh, don't think about yourself. Mm -hmm. He never taught us to do any practice for our, our the sake of our own spiritual quote unquote advancement. He said, "Love everyone, serve everyone, remember God." He would say, he say, when I was going to kill myself in India, I was having a nervous breakdown in the, in the temple right there. He said, what are you going to do? Jump in the river? Ha! Ah, you can't <laughs> die. He said, worldly people don't die. Mm. Only Jesus died the real death. Mm. What? <laughs> Why? Because he never thought of himself. The me, there was no me in there anymore, you know. And of course, he's describing Hanuman. He would say Hanuman, Christ, and Krishna, they're all the same, he'd say. Don't think about yourself. 
think about others. Mm -hmm. And of course, all we do is think about ourselves all day long. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Well, my story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we'll we'll talk about that. You'll Please, see. Please go ahead. See. It's a good it's a good example. So, um, you know, it's generally maintained that although the Valmiki Ramayana is the Adi Ramayana, the, the original Ramayana, and also the Adi Kavya, the first poem, right? Mm -hmm. But people will also say to you in India, but you know, actually, it's not. Actually, the first Ramayana was composed by Hanuman. So here's the story about this. And of course, you know, it comes out of Valmiki because in Valmiki, Hanuman tells the Rama story several times to various characters within the story. And he is a great storyteller uh, right from the beginning. And uh, so he, he develops a reputation for association with the story that seems to have led in um, quite a few hundred years ago to this story, which I'm going to tell you. So um, after Sita is banished uh, from Ayodhya to the forest when she's pregnant in, in the seventh book of Valmiki, Valmiki's Uttarakhand, Hanuman is still there in Ayodhya serving Rama, but you know, it isn't the same anymore. The atmosphere is very sad. Rama immerses himself in his kingly duties, but there's a kind of shadow of sorrow over him. Um, and because Sita has gone up, been sent away and Hanuman feels it very much. And he's, he considers Sita his mother and he's very unhappy too. And there's not much for him to do um, so he goes into the Himalayas and he finds a kind of a distant uh, mountain summit where there are these huge uh, crystalline slabs, you know, these kind of quartz crystal slabs that you sometimes see in the high mountains. And he begins with his, with his nail, uh, he begins inscribing the story of Ram on these slabs. And he, and he just keeps writing. He goes day after day, and he just keeps writing the story of Ram as he has experienced it. Meanwhile, Valmiki in his ashram, where Sita is living and has has given birth to twins, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Valmiki is of course finishing his version of the story, uh, commanded by Brahma, and he's he's composed his Ramayana. Um, and he's very happy with it. Brahma has given him deep uh, spiritual insight so that he's able to see everything. Anyway, but somebody comes and tells him and says, you know, uh, Hanuman has written the Ramayana also. And Valmiki says, really? And he's, he's thinking, well, Hanuman was there much of the time, but at the same time, is he a poet? You know, what, what, what kind of a composition could this possibly be? And so uh, one day, um, somehow they meet and Valmiki asks Hanuman about this and says, is it true you've written the story of Ram? And Hanuman says, yeah, yeah, I have. And Valmiki says, gee, could I see it? And Hanuman says, oh yeah, of course. And he puts Valmiki on his on his uh, back and flies to you know through the air to the Himalayas and takes him up to this mountain peak and puts him on a cliff and Valmiki starts reading this in, inscription you know and it's it must be a huge thing because this is, it's supposedly a, a very voluminous telling of the story and Valmiki is reading and reading and reading and reading. And Hanuman is just kind of nonchalantly sitting there. But he sees that Valmiki has tears streaming down his face. And um, he, after some time, he says to him, uh, oh, great sage, you know, is something the matter? What's wrong? Is it bad? Is it, you know, did I, is, are there a lot of mistakes? And Valmiki says, oh, it's so beautiful. 
it's so perfect. <laughs> no one, no one could ever tell the story better than this. And, and, and then he says, and of course, nobody's going to want to look at my Ramayana now. Um, and Hanuman looks at him and, and Hanuman says, really? Is it like that? And Hanuman puts Valmiki on his, on his back and he takes his arms, he grows to huge size and with his incredible strength, he tears the boulders, these crystalline slabs out of the side of the mountain, rips them out, puts them under his arm in a huge pile and he flies with them. Valmiki doesn't even have a moment to say anything. He flies with him out over the ocean and he gets to the middle of the ocean and he drops the slabs into the ocean and they fall down with a thunderous crash into the sea and, and sink out of sight. And Hanuman just says, Jai Shri Ram, as he, as he does this. And then he comes back to land and he brings Valmiki back to his ashram and sets him down and Valmiki is crying. And uh, Hanuman says, you know, kind of, now what's the matter? You know, are you okay? And Valmiki says, what you did, what you sacrificed, uh, you know, for the, for the sake of my poem. And Hanuman just says, oh, you know, it was nothing. It was just something that I did to pass the time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nothing. It doesn't matter. And Valmiki then says, son of the wind, in a future age, I will take birth again and I will retell the Ramayana as you have done um, in the language of the ordinary people, of the common people. Uh, and, and I will be your devotee and I will, I will worship you and I will do this in service to you. Um, mm. And of course, this is assumed to be Tulsidas. He's, he's referring to his mm. uh, return as Tulsidas. Mm. So. Beautiful story. Sita Ram. Yeah. Sita Ram. Ram. Beautiful. Wow. These are, I love going back and forth with these stories. And, um, you know, uh, we're getting maybe close, getting close to wrap up. But, uh, but I have a really short one which to play out, which is a perfect last one. Um, unless you have something to say, KD, I'll play out my last story. Go ahead. Um, and this one, you know, when I said that I went through or we went through the entire Ramayana and pulled out every Hanuman passage, I was 100% certain that the last passage in Uttarakhanda, where they talk about Hanuman, says at the, you know, the, the battle is over, Ram is crowned king, Sita is by his side, this is before Sita is banished, and Sage Augustia comes with a whole retinue of sages. And this goes on for, I don't know how long, weeks, months, where every day Sage Augustia is telling Ram and his brothers and Hanuman and Vibhishana and Sugriv, all of them are there, they've stayed on, telling them stories telling them stories of how great Ravana was and how even the gods couldn't be, believe that Ram defeated him. And then they're even more amazed that Ram and Lakshman was able to defeat Indrajit, who was actually even more powerful than Ravana. His, that was his son. So finally, finally, I don't know how many times Ram says goodbye to Augustia. Finally, Augustia goes home and Ram decides to say goodbye to his closest allies. He, says goodbye to Sugriv, and then Babishina, and then Hanuman. So this short clip that I'm going to play is um, really the, Ram's final words to Hanuman. And it, it starts with a little bit on um, little bit on, uh, on Babishina, and then it goes right into Hanuman. So here we go. This is about a three-minute clip. Having said this to Sugriva, Ram embraced him repeatedly. And he said to Babishina in pleasing words, Rule Lanka righteously. I know you are devoted to Dharma, and you are greatly loved by the Rakshasas who live in the city and by your brother, Vaishravana. Never incline your mind to unrighteousness, O king. 
Kings endowed with intelligence rule their kingdom in all security. And think of me and Sugriva always, O king, with affection. Go home now without a care. The apes and the Rakshasas applauded Ram, repeatedly saying, Well said, well said. Intelligence, valor, marvelous powers, and supreme sweetness of disposition are innate to you, O Ram, as to the self-create. When they all said this, Hanuman made his prostrations to Ram and prayed, May my friendship for you be ever unswerving, O king, and also my devotion. And O valiant one, may my love never be given to anyone but you. And I have no doubt that I shall inhabit this body so long as Ram's story is current on earth, O heroic one. The Apsarasas will of a certainty sing to me your life and deeds, O scion of the Ragus, O first of men. Hearing that nectar-like story of your doings, my lord, I shall be freed from the pain of intolerable longing as the wind carries off a wisp of cloud. When Hanuman said this, Ram got up from his throne and embracing him affectionately told him, It shall be as you wish. O oh, first of the apes, so long as my story is heard on earth, so long shall your fame last and life remain in your body. And the story of my deeds will be known so long as the hills last. If I gave up my life for any one of your acts of friendly help, I should be in your debt for all the others. Let all that you have done for me remain an undischarged debt for only in peril does a man who has done another a good turn look for its requital. Then taking from his own neck the pearl necklace that shone like the moon with a cat's eye for pendant, he put it round Hanuman's neck. With that splendid necklace resting on his chest, the ape shone like the great golden mountain with the moon on its shoulder. And having heard what Raghava said, the monkeys rose up and made repeated prostrations at his feet and departed. Sugriva was locked with Ram in a long embrace, breast against breast, and so was Vibhikna, the righteous soul. All of them shed tears of grief. With streaming eyes, they who could not speak for the tears that choked their throats, almost fainted with grief at having to part from Raghava. Showered with kindnesses by the high-souled Raghava, all of them departed to their homes as men leave behind the bodies they have tenanted. The Rakshasas, bears, and apes, making their prostrations to Ram, prosperer of the Ragus, went back like those who had lived long in one place, their eyes filling with tears of parting. Mm. So who says Valmiki Ramayana is not devotional? <laughs> so it's beautiful. It's just beautiful departing of the, the connection. And as long as Ram's story is told, Hanuman will be here. Hanuman will always be with us. As long as Ram's story is... And it appears that, Hanu, that Ram's story is, is not going anywhere. Thanks to Krishna Das singing its praise and Philip writing his scholarly works and me beating the drum, I hope, for every, you know, in our own, each in our own way and all of everyone in their own way, beating the drum and snapping their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have to have something to close with on this before we wrap tonight and uh, hopefully KD will sing again for us. Let me just read you this, uh, this, I guess this is the shloka. I don't know where it's from. Maybe you know where it's from. It describes Hanuman. It says, Hanuman, Hanuman, Saha Mahadeva, Kala Kalaha, Sada Shiva, Muktido Mukti Kaivalya, Muktido Sarva Kamada. It says, Hanuman is that Mahadev, Mahakala, the eternal goodness, the blissful one who bestows Mukti by allowing seekers to merge into his own state 
as well as bestowing the enjoyment of all one's cherished objects of desire. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. this is just so perfect. You know, it's, a, it's exactly what it felt like to be with Maharaji. He allowed us into the room where love lives. And <clears throat> of course, our own minds would take us out of there almost immediately. But then he would bring us back again and again. And, uh, but the idea that the, the, ex the description of how Hanumanji gives that liberation by allowing us to merge with him, and he's always turned to Ram. So when we merge with him, we also. Mm. So. It's beautiful. And also the idea that in the process, you also, he also allows us to satisfy the desires that we cherish, that we need to satisfy. It's not a renunciate situation, uh, at least at the beginning, you know, in the first, at the first, uh, as it develops. There's certain things you need to have, you know, and <clears throat> got to have a place to sleep, food, cable TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, money to take care of yourself and the people mm -hmm. who are you're responsible for. Mm -hmm. He allows all that. It's part of the process. It's not bad to have desires. It's not bad to satisfy desires within a certain situation, you know. And Maharaji always, it was like that. I always like that. So, you guys have anything to say about that shloka? Have you any, any of you heard it before? You know where it comes I from? I don't know that shloka. Yeah. yeah. I don't know either. It seems like it's Sanskrit. Yeah, it's Sanskrit. But I have no idea where it comes from. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, it's funny because you read that, and I had picked out something that just came today from the Gita course, which it looks like this is from um, Path to God by Ramdas. Um, and it really just underscores what you said in a slightly different way from that shloka. It said, the point of all the bhakti practices is to kindle that kind of love and then divert it towards God or towards the guru. One can connect it with some concept of a supreme being, the universe, Brahman, or one can find some form on the physical plane to love, someone to use as a doorway, and eventually through the love to pass beyond. I'm just inserting that to me, that's Hanuman here. So whatever the form, we open our hearts to it. We use chanting, we use meditation, we use yoga. We use any and all of the practices of bhakti devotion to fan the intensity of our love for the being who has awakened our heart. And to me, that's just a beautiful description of what Hanuman does for so many people. <clears throat> Philip, do you have something to, to wrap it up with? <laughs> Not really, no. I think you've uh, put it well. <clears throat> and that last, um, that last Valmiki passage uh, recalled the the uh, line in the in the uh, in the praise poem that uh, Krishna Das began with Yatra, you know, Yatra Yatra Raghunatha Kirtanam, wherever Rama's praises are sung, you are there. Yeah, uh, Hanuman is there, and um, I always thought about that when I was teaching uh, Ramayana, you know, to students at the university. Uh, I would say to students, well, you know, people. Uh, people who love the Ramayana in India, they would say that Hanuman is here in the room right now because we're talking about the Ramayana. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. they, When I recorded the Ramayana, the original <laughs> audio production, you know, the 75-hour mm -hmm. mega production I did of the entire unabridged Valmiki Ramayana, yeah. we, I didn't do one recording session without setting a seat for Hanuman and mm -hmm. inviting him. Yeah, be there, and I think that's why the 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 production has some shakti because Hanuman Shakti was in yeah. the production. 
Yeah, and the Ramayanis do that in India. They they make an asana for for Hanuman often in the uh, on the the platform or wherever they're speaking. <clears throat> yeah, mm. nice. And, and even today, I just had my little Hanuman. This is what I put in my pocket there. Ah. This is goes. And you want to know something that the when when they finally did the first Diwali celebration in the White House, they gave this to Obama, something like this to Obama. He's been carrying it in his pocket for years. A Hanuman little a little Hanuman Murti. He's been carrying when someone gave it to him because in Bal in in Indonesia where he his family comes from, Hanuman is yeah. worshipped. Yeah. yeah. He has one little metal one he carries. Yep. <clears throat> So, right. shall you want to sing to close the... Uh, sure, I'll sing a little bit. Oh, 
Sabahama Karna Sagar Krupaneda E Bajarangi Jayahama Sankata Mocham Paneda E Bajaranga Bali Hanuma Sankata Mocham Siara de Baba Hanuma Sankata Mocham Krupa Neda Jayabadaranga Bali Hanuma Lala Langote Lala Nesha Shri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram Shri Ram Jai Ram traditions are paths into our own hearts and they are living paths, living practices, living realities, always present for us. And if we know anything about a path at all, it's only because of the great beings that have gone before us. Out of their love, out of their kindness, they left some footprints for us to follow. So, in the same way that they wish for us, in the same way that they wish for us, we wish that all beings everywhere, all of us be safe, all of us be happy, that all of us have good health and enough to eat. And may we all live in peace and at ease of heart, at ease of heart with whatever comes to us in life.
Namaste. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Namaste. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. As they say in India, Ram Ram. Sitaram. Sitaram. Ram Ram Sitaram. <laughs>